besides, of course, in acknowledging the human cost, uh, the human cost behind it. It's just, um, you know, we can focus though within the bounds of what we can we can talk about around the economic ideas. I am going live, and yes, there we were kind of blindsided this month <laughs> by certain events, and uh, I imagine certain things are not reflected in the report tomorrow or can't be fully reflected and we would need to reconvene a month later in which who knows <laughs> what will have happened by then that is true it's it's likely i think after this data and then with one more data point we'll know we'll know more colin we'll know more yeah oh, oh, albert's right we didn't price in the war into this month's webinar <laughs> who, who oh, could have gosh. guessed um, we will make small talk for a few more minutes while people start uh, rolling in, um, but uh, quite a few highlights for the month, even though we're a day early. Um, obviously, the Ukraine issue, there mm -hmm. is uh, the stock market's been quite interesting right. to, to follow. And we're going to talk about that too. And commodity prices are 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 uh, are gangbangers, gangbusters right now. They have a um, right now commodity prices. Oil surged past one thirty two nights ago per barrel. It's back now to one ten, but uh, it's the highest prices we've seen since. Well, if we adjust for inflation, two thousand eleven. But in aggregate, it was the highest we saw since two thousand eight. Oh boy, yeah. It, it was, gas is like six dollars per gallon here. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. You know, it's good. To, you know, the, the best thing is that, and so this is always the thing, right? People always talk about with, with regards to commodity prices and other things. They're always like, you know, is it beneficial? You know, what if we release, you know, you know, you know, oil from our strategic petroleum reserve? And, and we have a lot of data on doing that in the past. Um, we consume about 18 million barrels of oil per day. Uh, uh, in, as, a, as a country. So when we talk about the uh, consumption, we're looking at our strate whole strategic reserve holds about 700 million barrels. So if we got rid of it all, which we would never do, it would, it would be a month, a little bit more than a month and a half supply. And then, um, you know, and then we would have, and so, but the numbers they talk about 60 million or 90 million, I mean, this is days, days worth of consumption. And consequently, that's why you only see a little bit of a bump uh, uh, in the prices, although it, it can effort, and it's really a momentum strategy. When you release uh, uh, oil from the um, strategic reserve, you're trying to put a cap on prices to prevent prices from coming back at you. Oh, wow, look at this. If, uh, uh, Albert uh, uh, says, I read today that if you adjusted the oil prices in California from 2009 to 2011 for inflation in 2022, the average gas price would be 580 a gallon right now. So we're still below that. Yes, you're right. So that's actually a good point. And if we did that aggregate across the economy, we converted that into another measure, which is how many uh, hours you have to work or how many, <laughs> let's think about this, or, or uh, how many hours do you have to work for a gallon of gas or vice versa? Uh, uh, how many gallons can you buy with an hour wage? Uh, we're actually at levels that are somewhat below the all-time highs we saw back in, 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 in 08, 09. And so that is somewhat reassuring. And certainly I noticed, I saw, I read something as well. I'm like, you know, they were, I, I read something about that uh, in the first week of March, uh, BART ridership was, was at the highest <laughs> level this year so always small small things people are people when people have access to public transportation can they use it and do they substitute it for other things uh if it's economically uh, uh, uh if it's economically beneficial to do so so yes that's right quick, quick check can you uh share screen and to and share? yes okay you, you can okay i can i have the capability Okay, yes. Um, <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's Good get this ball guys. rolling. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to a weird time in history. Um, welcome to our February 2022 jobs report. Um, and we wanted to say uh, consumer price inflation a recap, but we are a bit early, but we will go through what we can. Um, today, we're going to recap what's been going on in February. Uh, there is an elephant in the room. I think we were predicting uh, 500,000 jobs. Um, we'll also be 
recapping how certain uh, events are <laughs> impacting the economy and possibly jobs. Um, and uh, while we can't give you an update on the inflation numbers, we will do our best to cover what, uh, how it might affect you and your job searching prospects. Uh, with us today is Dr. Riley White, an Associate Professor of Finance and Endowed Bank of America Lecturer at the University of New Mexico. In addition to teaching MBA students, Dr. White serves as the University Outreach Chair for the CFA Society of New Mexico. Chair of the Cassidy CFA Scholarship and advisor for the 3.6 million student run UNM Regents portfolio. Prior to his career in academia, Dr. White worked as an analyst for a large Boston based bank where he learned a great deal about company analysis, funding, and maintaining ethical corporate leadership. As a note, this uh, meeting will be recorded and made available within seven business days. Now, over to you, Dr. White. Oh, thank you so much, Colin. Thank you so much uh, for those of you attending tonight on Albert's List. I am so grateful uh, that you've uh, made some time on your Wednesday evening. Uh, uh, hopefully, maybe you've booked hours, maybe you're working till six and, and you told your boss you were in an important meeting. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to discuss and uh, so excited uh, to talk about this jobs report. I want to acknowledge as well the current events that are happening right now and and, and, and how deeply consequential they are, not only in, the, in a human way, uh, uh, and, and also uh, an economic one. Uh, often in economics, we overlook humanity, and I just want to make a statement that I acknowledge, and I fully, you know, a lot is happening right now, and I want you to be aware of it. But in the meantime, this focus on this will be sort of the economic effects. I encourage you during the presentation to ask questions. I apologize for the poor lighting. I'm even more washed out than usual. I had a little, uh, I had an additional, um, a uh, uh, light fixture here to help improve the lighting and the contrast in my camera. Uh, and unfortunately, it, uh, is, it, it might have bit the dust uh, in, my, in, in the last few minutes. So what we're going to do is we'll get started on this jobs report. Ask any questions you want. No such thing as a silly one. I, I feel good about all the questions that you can answer. All of these things are important. And, and there's some things for which we just don't know uh, enough about. But, um, but that being said is there's a lot happening right now, a lot of current events. We're in the midst of a heavy amount of volatility. And uh, keep dropping your questions. And as Albert points out in the chat, uh, 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 Albert Collin points out in the chat, Albert uh, is also online. Uh, feel free to drop questions into the chat. We'll address them when we can. Very happy to receive them and very happy to do them live. All right, so let's talk about our February jobs report. And I added some sections on inflation and uh, equities. And we've got a whole bunch of shenanigans to talk about. So first, let's start off with our jobs report. Perhaps uh, uh, the least exciting thing uh, in the last couple of weeks, but also a source of some promise and some additional uh, uh, sources of hope. So the February 2022 jobs report, the summary is, uh, surprise, surprise, again, in a positive way, expecting about a half million jobs. We exceeded that and got 678,000 jobs. This is a good jobs report by all regards. Unemployment edged downward to 3.8%. Uh, uh, last month, it rose slightly. I kept that number in there to show you. I should have pointed it out. Last month, unemployment rose slightly uh, uh, to about uh, uh, 4%. This has since come down a little bit. And the good news is our labor force and aggregate expanded. Where were those jobs located? We had 124,000 jobs in restaurants specifically. And this is interesting. One of the other sideways, I haven't really mentioned this in previous months that we've done this, an aspect in the economy that we've seen more uh, more people in a function of sort of the nature of this labor market is temporary help services. Temporary help is often cross sector, cross disciplinary, and it can involve a great deal of materials. We saw an addition, uh, addition of 36,000 in temporary help services here. And it is in some ways, it's, it's both bad and good. Often we ask ourselves, you know, is this, are, are people selecting temporary jobs because it's convenient for them? Are they hoping for more full-time jobs? Given the strength of this market, and giving the availability of full-time jobs. We'll get into that in a second. There's some reason to suggest that, well, maybe this is, this is more of a sign of functional choice uh, uh, or perhaps um, uh, could serve as, as an intermediate job between people who might be otherwise shifting careers. So we actually added about 60,000 in construction and that's really promising because as we look ahead right now, one of the, we have a lot of headwinds 
uh, in construction. So what, all right, let me back up a second. As you know, asset prices have been going up. They've been skyrocketing significantly over the last year. Um, and we'll get into what, how the Fed has played a role in that. Uh, but right now you have things like housing, things like commodities exploding at levels that we have not foreseen. And when we think about those levels and we think about how to engage uh, uh, construction or how to even out this market, you know, one of the things is, is we expect construction uh, to uh, sort of fill the gap and produce more units when possible. And therefore the aggregation or addition of units will help, uh, uh, will help reduce prices in the long run. And so we have 60,000 new construction workers there. That was good. I was really looking for spring numbers. We usually see an uptick across the country in spring uh, uh, as, as other places shake off their winter cold and start other construction projects. That's still promising that building is going ahead. Um, I'm looking forward or actually very interested in what next month month's numbers show uh, or if we have any um, reaction to that. Uh, the headwinds to construction are vast. Uh, not least our commodity prices, which are still really, really high, making it very expensive to build stuff. And one of the reasons that we've seen construction projects delayed, uh, we've seen uh, labor issues as well as a lack of, uh, of, of affordable materials. And that's uh, sort of threw a wrench into many uh, a project managers uh, hat or otherwise, or a beret. I don't know if project managers, project manager seems it's more of a beret, beret field. Anyway, uh, surprisingly low wage growth this, 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 uh, this month. This is really interesting because last month the excitement was wage growth was going up and it was going up at such a clip in our January report. We had suggested that, well, maybe this is enough to power long-term inflation. Right now, wage growth is only about 0.1%. 0.1% is, is actually remarkably slow considering it's running parallel to inflation that exceeds 7% across the country. Um, and, and, and the good news is, I guess on that, is that it still ended up being, if we look at a 12 month period, it ends up working out to still about 5.1% growth, but obviously annualized, you're looking at a number in the, in, in the ones, and that is not only um, insufficient to keep up with rising prices, uh, but it's a very interesting symptom of what might be going on in, in the economy economy as a whole. And finally, labor force participation actually grew slightly inched up 0.1% from 62.2 to 62.3. So all of this, this was actually, it, it, uh, uh, regardless of, 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 of sort of everything else that's happening at this moment, this jobs report was very good. This was a good jobs report, and it was one that I was hoping would happen for a while. Uh, we saw gains across the board, across a number of sectors. Um, in January, there's a chart on the right uh, from the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, in January, there were still uh, sectors that lost jobs. None of our major sectors actually lost jobs, and gains were well distributed uh, last month. And, and that's very promising. That shows that, that economic growth has become a little bit more even than before. It's still highly concentrated in areas where we saw the most deductions at the beginning of the pandemic or the most losses. Uh, so things like leisure and hospitality, restaurants we're talking about. But again, we also have transportation and warehousing has continued a robust winter uh, with transportation and warehousing adding a significant number of jobs. We don't normally see a lot of that, but of course that's due to, is to, con to continued issues in supply chains, as well as just an aggregate need uh, 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 to, to transport goods and services. It's also symptomatic. So in a broad in sense, people will look at the economy and say, oh my goodness, we have inflation. Is it stagflation? Is it stagnant? The economy is humming along quite well. This is just regular inflation and strong economic growth. And, and the issue right now is, is whether economic growth will end up stalling this year or inflation will stall and who is going to blink first. So right now we have, of course, uh, good economic growth and good uh, simultaneously uh, uh, strong growth in our other sectors. And so, and so this is really interesting. So my concerns around this are that obviously we want transport, transportation and warehousing is often symptomatic of, of consumer demand. And, and, and all of this shows robust consumer demand for stuff things are, are happening and, and, and people are buying buying things. And, and all of this in aggregate basically means that the economy is still recovering quite well. On the other hand, though, we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to break down you know, you know, some of these issues, uh, as well as some of the labor market concerns and, and what might be causing them. And I'm actually going to, I'm going to switch around. I just realized that I should probably switch around two charts that I'd given later, but I'll take a look at that in a second. Don't worry about that now. All right. So, so let's look a little bit on the sector side. So, so where have we come? What an adventure this has been uh, over the last two years. 
February 2020 to February 2022. It was two years ago, this very month where we were sitting and evaluating, you know, our, our the the beginning of a pandemic. We all remember those that that age where the, the bygone era, the before times when uh, uh, we didn't understand or we didn't we knew we had this dangerous virus and it was starting to happen. And the closures began in March and April and upended so many lives, including my guess is many of you uh, who are here today in the audience. So let's talk about sectors and, and where we are from where we were in 2020 to where we are today. And so we look at our employment change by industry since February 2020, we are still down a million and a half jobs in leisure and hospitality. We're still down almost 700,000 government. I'll talk about that in a second because that was my other side focus on this is looking at how the private and public sectors react to different recessions. Um, and then of course we have education and health services also down about 500,000. On the other side of it, we now have net there are five sectors where we now have more jobs now than we did prior to the pandemic. And that's an information robust for the Bay Area. And then of course, uh, financial activities, retail services, transportation warehousing, as we get, <laughs> I mean, this is the thing, why do you need an extra half a million transportation workers? Because we have supply chain issues. And this is, becomes really, this is, this is the response of government seeking to find new ways and pathways in response to profound supply chain concerns. And so things that CEOs would otherwise write off in their booklets, oh, transportation as being a thing, became a priority item, hence the hiring. And then professional and business services. So all the other stuff that goes into making uh, a companies work, run, and et cetera, et cetera, have also been robust. Uh, no, when, you, when you're running into an issue with, with, with an economic situation, hire a consultant. So the other section on the right side, you see a graph between private sector employment and then also public sector employment. The big picture is, is in the private sector, they fire quicker and more profoundly, but they also hire quicker and more profoundly. Government work, uh, there are fewer layoffs, but the recovery is much, much slower. Um, and you see that in the profiles of different states, states that have a lot of government workers relative to their population often are slow in recovery compared to states that uh, that are otherwise not. So government can be an insulating factor, but it also prevents you from from uh, uh, from from sort of achieving um, uh, rapid growth following uh, uh, some some net benefit. Now here's the other thing as well. So let's think about this, and this is actually really promising because I. I looked at, I was looking at a whole bunch of data uh, and we, we track a, a large number of data that looks at questions around participation rate and other things. You heard me, if you were attended a, a, a session a couple months ago, we talked about how the participation rate, you know, it's been, it, it maxed out in 2000. It's since gone down quite a bit. We saw a massive increase in workforce participation, people uh, looking for jobs, having jobs, uh, unemployed, but looking are part of the, you know, uh, we, we saw uh, the participation rate surge the 70s, 80s, and 90s as women entered the workforce. And then starting in 2000, we kind of ended up on this other side where, where we've seen these continued drops. Some of these are generational. They're based off of retirement. Uh, what happens is during recessions, it clears out a bunch of workers and they just don't return. And so our, 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 uh, our, our, our participation rates right now are not what they were a few years ago. And they're not even, they're not even that, they're, they're, they're not good relative to our long-term 25 year average, but they have improved drastically over the last two years. Now, now, if we look at a different measure of this, if we look at our total employment to population ratio, which focuses on workers age 25 to 54, and compare that basically over the last 33 years, let's pick a number. Uh, and what we find is that right now we've surged up to about 79.5% of workers aged between 25 and 54 uh, uh, are currently employed. That is a, historically, that's actually a very good number. There has been some hesitation when we look at this. So, so, so let me go back on this. There was questions about, well, are there are people of working age? They have kids they probably have to take care of. They might have parents they have to take care of. Uh, they have uh, uh, other reasons for leaving the workforce. For instance, uh, pursuing graduate education, pursuing other lines of education. We were deeply worried that this number would, would, would take a very long time to, to sort of go back, back up again. And what we've seen is actually a very steep slope. And as you can see towards the right end, uh, drastically hit in 2020, falling below 70% for the first time that we've started tracking this decades ago, uh, and then reaching almost 80% now. And, and to give you a sense of this, I want you to focus focus 
on that first time period, so we had, of course, 2008 to 2009, the Great Recession, we saw uh, uh, employment ratios drop from 80% to 75. And it took it took 10 years to get back up to where we were before. And so one silver lining in this job market in particular, there's a lot of silver, there's a lot of silver, there's gold, there's palladium, but there's less now because of the, of the sanctions. Uh, but uh, uh, there is, upwardly speaking, a trajectory that is actually genuinely impressive. And it shows that every time you enter into a casual conversation with young people or middle-aged people don't want to work anymore, they're working. Everyone is working. They're all working. And that's fascinating. Vikram, it's good to see you again. Any Democrat graphic trends uh, in current re-employment? Also, has Fred or some other national measurement started tracking population? Oh, contracting population size. Ooh, two, two separate but very interesting questions. So the first, demographic, uh, uh, so all right, so this is a really good question. Let's look at demo, uh, uh, the demographic trends with reemployment. And let's see if I can grab that chart for you really quick. And I should be able to grab it here. Let me, uh, it'll take one second. Now the population size thing is actually really interesting. As you know, when the Census Bureau reported uh, data or estimates for the last year, or you may not know, our population growth uh, has been uh, the lowest that we've seen since we started keeping track of this and sort of as a percentage and in and, and the dawn of our country. Some of that, of course, was related to COVID-related mortality, COVID-related COVID issues, as well as other aspects, but it's also uh, substantially reduced migration. And it's also substantially reduced natural growth rate. And that becomes a very interesting question. So let me do, 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 go back here for a second, because I realize I'm really bad at multitasking and you asked a really good question. Let me click on this. Because I'm like, I will talk about this issue. And then meanwhile, I'm pretending the other side of my brain is looking up uh, <laughs> looking up data. Um, I actually have some right here. I, I had this in front of me. I was going to post the demographic data, Vikram, but I was this close to doing it. And for some uh, unexplainable reason, I, I hesitated and didn't include it. Because I actually was tracking. I have all the unemployment data uh, uh, going back. And we have it separated into different demographic classes. Uh, different exposés. Let me see if I can grab this real quickly here. Do, do, do. Good. We have that data. Good, good, good. I might have to do this manually. So policy institute. Let's see if we got this here. Maybe I can't get it. So long story short, it has been dragging, but I can give you some recent data on this. So if we look at this from a historical perspective and I bring up just our BLS data, um, for some reason, the graphs are never there when I want to find them. Uh, uh, no, don't apologize, uh, uh, Vikram, it's very good. Uh, let me go back here. Okay, here's what we got. So right now, jobless rates, if we look across different demographic levels, <laughs> Uh, we saw sort of general consensus is, is we saw unemployment rate drop further for adult men in Hispanic populations, uh, but our rates for adult women, uh, teenagers, uh, whites in general and aggregate in uh, uh, blacks, Asians, uh, uh, as reported by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, so African Americans, uh, uh, Asian Americans, uh, Caucasian Americans, uh, ended up relatively flat. Right now, unemployment rate uh, uh, for whites was about 3.3%, 6.6% for African-Americans, and for Asian-Americans, about 3.1%. Now, when we think about this, there's many ways we measure um, unemployment. One might be we look at rehiring in the presence of those jobs. Generally speaking, if we look at these numbers, these are historically low in aggregate across different demographic groups. But of course, that belies undergoing mechanisms that happen within society and, and form much part of a larger question question about, about whether the jobs are actually available uh, for the people that are actually searching for them. But again, to be counted in the unemployment rate, you have to be searching for a job. Now, when we think about, uh, oh yes, for freelancing work, uh, Vikram, that's a good question. So when we think about uh, the population relative to freelancing and whether we can look at this. So one question would be is whether or not we include that as part of our metrics or whether we think primarily that the uh, participation rate drop was caused in part by people freelancing. And so far, it seems that most freelancers in some way, shape or form, either by process of incorporation or otherwise through the, our employment surveys indicate themselves as employed. Uh, we know they're counted as part of the workforce. But the question that ultimately comes down to is whether or not, and there's separate questions, 
Um, we think of unemployment primarily from a, a U3 standpoint, which is people that are part of the workforce, but looking for a job, people might be uh, uh, freelancing because they are unavailable to find other work or, or they might have other, uh, other concerns that are really profound in the workforce. I don't have that information. And maybe what we can do is let me do a deep dive into that, Vikram. Uh, next time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look up some freelance data. I know you've asked this before. So let me see if I can find some data on that, and I'll get some data on that for you. But that's the interesting part is they should be because it's a survey-generated report. It should be included as being employed, but you should also, uh, there might be some concerns as to whether the classification of that employment or, or even the number of freelancers period, which is notoriously difficult to track. And you ask a good question. A simple question is, is Fred keeping track of this, uh, which is our Federal Reserve Economic Data Center? Uh, does, our, does, does the Federal Reserve keep track of freelance work? And if we look at this, the short answer is not really, or at least not defined in the way that is authoritatively that way. Um, so my guess is the short answer to this is that we end up having a great need for data that we don't already possess. And the difficulties with obtaining that data has prevented a tracking mechanism from occurring. I don't know, uh, I can call up my, my colleagues at the, at the Fed to see if they're working on it, but that's a great question. That's a really good question. So speaking of the Fed, let's talk a little bit about this. So one of the things about the Fed is, is, is we talk about this, the Federal Reserve, for instance, is, is such a momentous and important concept. And I know I talk about this periodically every couple of months. Uh, uh, and the Fed as a, as a banker of banks sets one rate called the discount rate, which is effectively just uh, lending to overnight lending to large banks. Now, this discount rate is really important as they set it because it uh, helps, helps monitor, helps control monetary policy. When the Fed chooses to raise rates, that has a ripple effect through our system, raising rates across the board, constricting monetary supply, and making economic activity that may otherwise be justifiable and seem like a good idea, not really I, I'm not really economically tenable. And on the other side of this question, and on the other side, and this is on the other side of this, you also have this, this sort of background uh, um, uh, around, you know, uh, you know, you know, the Fed's influence on, on quantitative easing. So during uh, the pandemic, not only were, were rates, which had briefly risen in 2018, uh, right before the pandemic, dropped again to zero, uh, but in the short-term rates, but the Fed had all of these soft or, or other measures of quantitative easing, which included uh, a, a lot of support to help our asset markets, our bond markets. And the fear is, is that during times of crisis or volatility, people might not offer enough bonds on the market to be bought or sold at fair prices. That can result in liquidity crises. That can result in huge swings, like we saw sort of in 2008 in the banking crisis. Uh, we saw vast swings in, 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 in bond values and situations, and we saw a, a dearth of liquidity. People were so hesitant and so worried they wouldn't get a fair price for their goods. They didn't offer any goods uh, for sale or bonds or other financial instruments for sale, and that can have a, a devastating effect on the market. So in an effort to keep things liquid, the Fed buys a lot of assets. A lot of these assets include things like mortgages. They include things like bonds. They include a lot of things. And they've accumulated, if we look at the total assets of the Federal Reserve, and I went back five years here, uh, uh, from 2018, 2017 to today, um, we saw the Fed in 2018 uh, uh, they acquired many assets. They acquired about four and a half trillion dollars of assets as part of the earlier, earlier quantitative easing program. They started to unwind in 2019. And then the pandemic happened. And all of our plans for what happens to the economy when we start unwinding the balance sheet of the Fed were out the window. And the Fed began rapidly supporting the bond market by buying a lot of bonds. And right now they have about nine trillion dollars. $9 trillion worth of bonds. And, and one, one, one <laughs> federal employee, uh, Federal Reserve Chair famously said, uh, in the last couple of weeks, they have no idea what a normal Fed balance sheet looks like anymore because it is such a vast number. And so one question is, is okay, so Jerome Powell has said, we're going to start unwinding some of this as part of our, uh, our, our sort of quantitative tightening issue. What are the effects and what are gonna what's gonna happen because of this? And the Federal Reserve of Kansas City had this had a great paper by uh, Smith and, 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 and Val Carcel up there uh, on uh, this very topic. 
And unfortunately, they're limited in their data analysis because we really have just, this is such a, an unorthodox thing that we only started doing this after, we did this a little bit during the Great Recession. We did this, we, uh, we've done this more and more, but we haven't done it to this scale and we haven't unwound to this scale before. So I wanna have a little asterisk saying, we don't know precisely how this will affect markets and stop. But in general, when we unwind asset purchases or when we take, when the Fed has a balance sheet and they either delete them or they sell them on the market again, this does result in tighter financial conditions. But we think about the relative effects of certain things. Uh, when the Fed quantitatively eases by buying bonds, that produces a substantial positive quantitative and li liquidity effect to the market. If they start tightening, they found that it's not as big of an effect. So the magnitude of tightening, even if, if they unwound, if you imagine this was, uh, if this chart continued onward and they unwound and sort of mirrored it and they gradually unwound even at the same rate, we would expect those tightening, uh, tightening effects to be more muted uh, than, than the easing effects. And the paper here goes into a whole bunch of details why. Some of it is because of bank reserves. Some of it is about just the nature of how money travels through the economy. So the good news is, is that it shouldn't be catastrophic. But it does result in, in tighter financial conditions. What does that mean for you and me? Think about uh, uh, tighter financial conditions manifest itself in different ways. Uh, right now, we've lived through a period where, where you can get a loan for a number of things. We have uh, business loans. We have money sloshing around the system and people finding a way to put it finding a place to put it. Uh, the last 10 years, we've seen explosions in places like private equity uh, uh, from investors because uh, not only be uh, mainly because of the promised returns in, in relation to other things, uh, but also because it represents um, uh, investors were hungry to find places to put their money. They'll be a little bit more conservative now. And that has effects on asset markets, stock market, uh, private equity markets that will have effects on, on a lot of different things of the economy. And the Fed had bought these bonds and other assets to keep yields and borrowing costs low fundamentally to help encourage us uh, uh, to have a swift recovery. We have a swift, this is a swift recovery, uh, but as swift as we've ever seen, but it also comes with that other uh, other factor of inflation. And unwinding may result in sort of dampening growth to asset prices. I used the, I was trying to think of an adjective here that was appropriate. I used dampening, like it's like, I, I mean, the thing is there's gonna be a couple things that are gonna dampen asset price growth. One is that the Fed's gonna raise rates which will have effects across the system in terms of asset prices. But then this will also, particularly I'm thinking about the mortgage market and housing market, this will take some steam out of it because the Fed just, possesses trillions of dollars worth of mortgages. And so consequently unwinding this, this, this will contribute to uh, sort of this dampening uptake in asset prices, uh, which has favored people who own homes over people who don't, um, and also potentially equities. Uh, so Vikram says, thanks for the perspectives. All right, good. Uh, 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 asked again, uh, as a few other countries have onboarded a lot of freelancers. Oh, Vikram, thank you so much for the continuation. Uh, via platforms in 2021, it's unclear how many newly employed versus cannibalizing some full-time employment. Ooh, that's great. I'm going to screenshot that right there, and I'm going to put that in my in my financial Rolodex for next month. So that'll be good. I'm going to make a note in it. I'm actually going to put it in my calendar too. So I'm going to I'm going to have if I if I include multiple reminders and mechanisms, Vikram, I will I will have the ability uh, to get back to you in a small amount of time. I'm, I'm just taking a stab here or, or a shank. I'm gonna say our, our next meeting will be on the 8th and I'll say uh, San Francisco Bay Area freelancers. I think I have a few questions. So what I just heard- Yeah, was, shoot Colin, what do you got? Yeah, the, so what I just heard is effectively the feds in order to bring <laughs> us out of the 2020 recession really quickly, they bought a lot of bonds and we see nine trillion worth of bonds being bought to yes. effectively save the economy and keep things right. flowing. Now they're announcing that they're unwinding it, which historically will result in lower liquidity and mm. constraining of markets. But aren't they also announcing uh, rate hikes? Like in yes. like, <laughs> when you put like two things that are designed to introduce a recession yes. together, don't you get an amplification effect? That just doesn't sound like a good time going forward to me. Ooh, that's a very, I like that. I like the astute, uh, uh, that's very right, Colin. So, so I like your perspective on that. It is an amplification, it is an amplification effect. 
And right now the prevailing theory is, or what we have from our sort of very limited, and we're talking about 10 years of really empirical data where this form of quantitative easing has been employed in a limited sense, but again, not to this level. So we don't, we don't really know, is that the amplitude effects uh, skew highly in favor of rate increases as opposed to unwinding, but it does add, let me put it say, so whether or not, it, it, if, if we were to factor this out, if 70% if, if of our drop in liquidity is rate hikes and 30% is, is unwinding, that's still substantial. They have to do this in a gradual way. The markets are aware of this fundamentally. Some of this is priced in to some extent, but I, I, I think the, the, the Fed has been really hesitant and I would even say reticent to even engage a, a meaningful conversation about this, the particular plan, because what's going to happen is they're going to play it month by month uh, on the next year, depending on the prevailing economic situation. Right now, there's a big fundamental danger in that we, to that amplification effect you, that you pointed out, you know, we, I mean, the Fed knows that ultimately its target for inflation should lie around 2%. To get from 7.5% to 2% requires, so the question is, is how do you do that without overshooting? And, and this becomes, you know, it's, 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 uh, this is so hard because if you raise rates too quickly on the left side of that, and so what we talked about before yield curves, yield curves connect all of government debt. And so when government doesn't have enough money to, um, uh, uh, to pay for uh, its budget, it issues bonds. Um, and it would issue bonds anyway, but, but, but bonds are issued whenever we spend more money than we have, which has been every year since the mid nineties. Uh, and uh, and we, issue, we issue bonds and we all buy bonds. Other countries buy bonds. Everybody buys, we, all, we, own, we own bonds. Bonds are owned by, every, we're all the debt holders for the US government. And the issue is of course, is that, is that so let's say for a second though, that uh, the Fed raises rates really quickly um, and, and, and you know, they raise rates in such a way that long-term rates don't come up with it. And I was having a discussion about some, some, this very topic with a municipal finance professional, a CFA, who I respect uh, a great deal. And, you know, and his belief is, and, and is that because the Fed is going to unwind these, 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 these assets, they're going to flood the market with bonds, many of which are very long-term in nature. They're often 20-year bonds, 30-year bonds. And so if you flood the market with bonds, you know, you know, you know, the question is, is how will people respond? Are they going to expect a lower interest rate or a higher interest rate for these bonds? And his argument is, is that the only reason people would buy or acquire more bonds at this uh, long-term bonds at this level is if the government promised them higher interest rates. And so his potential is, is that, yes, the Fed will raise rates in the short term, and those 30-year yields will also go up. And we look for that because that means the yield curve will still be upwardly sloping, which implies economic growth in the future. When the yield curve flattens, it has predicted uh, each of the last six recessions or so, um, and, and really seven of the last eight uh, have been predicted by uh, inverted yield curves, including the pandemic. Uh, recession was also preceded by an inverted yield curve, or when uh, short-term rates are equivalent to long-term rates. That is a fear. And we could suddenly go from this economy that was it's humming along into an economy that becomes recession-like in a very, within a year or two at, 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 this, at this mechanism. I actually was talking to another financial professional today in the field. He's another CFA. He's president of a CFA society. And his argument is, oh, you know, he's expecting, well, maybe we're going to see negative uh, uh, GDP growth uh, uh, towards the end of this year. And that's horrifying to think about. It's horrifying because if we have two quarters of consecutive negative GDP growth, then we end up with um, we end up with a recession, or officially a recession. One quarter is just you're allowed one quarter, but two quarters, then you're in a recession. Um, you know, it's like <laughs> what is what is two quarters buy you these days? Uh, eight, 18 seconds of parking. Uh, but um, what do you think? But that's a good call. You, that's a great point. So the question is: is they're going to likely this curve will be this curve of unwinding will be steep and it'll be, I guess, variable depending on the prevailing economic conditions of each month. That's my guess. And it will be, it'll look more like the slope of this chart, but downward on the, on the right end between 2021 and 2022, which is still a ton of money. That, that is a lot of assets yes. to unwind. Um, I'm and, just worried that because we do know that the feds have pretty much, Jerome Powell has, said that he did not expect inflation to go this bad no we know <laughs> last Jerome Powell says what's on his mind and I appreciate that <laughs> we, we know from last month that it was 7.5 percent we don't know what that number is going to be tomorrow it yes might be higher might be lower um but like it's we're at the point where raising rates is 
probably inevitable. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> when combined with this unwinding of assets, I'm just worried we're throwing field to a, a bonfire. That is true. Uh, you know, and this is <laughs> the calculus here is incredible that you have to do to manage and anticipate. So we already overshot where we thought inflation would be. And then on the other side, and then we ask ourselves the second question, can we predict, can we manage the economy in such a way that we don't over restrict the economy and force us into recession, or we're not too gentle handed and force a prolonged period of, of inflation. That is the fundamental macroeconomic policy problem of this year. And, and, and this is the hard part is that the brilliant people, smart people who study this for a living all the time, you know, you can be very wrong about this. And, and, and it's a thing that, that happens, even the, whether it's the Fed or somewhere else, and whether we're looking at data and, and modality, and, and even though we have now hundreds of factors and, and that we can run models on and, and regress, we're often incorrect. <laughs> we're, most, we're more often incorrect, but even incorrect beyond the bounds of, of, of what we would consider a reasonable prediction. So Colin, I share your anxiety about this, and it does keep me up at night <laughs> in a meaningful way. All right. <laughs> So yeah, this is good. So one of the things, and so the other thing that, that they're looking at right now is that the other interesting part about the hiring market, and also what, what also throws off some of our data and creates some skew, is quit rates, of course, we, have, we talked about that last time, they're still near record highs. And yes, they've been steady, and a bunch of articles came out, quit rates are steady, but they're still near record highs, almost 3% of all workers leave their jobs in any given month, uh, which is much higher than average. Uh, for instance, right after the pandemic, it was about half of that. Uh, proportionately. Um, and then you have, of course, the question of job openings. Job openings have remained, there's over 11.2 million job openings right now. That is an extraordinary number because it's more than double what our uh, number of unemployed uh, citizens are. So we have jobs in places for which there are no workers. And part of that reason is, and I, I kicked this down to our second part, but I'm going to bring this back up again, um, because this is just an important thing to note. And, and I think, I mean, this is the, the drum I like to beat that very few other, uh, there's a lot to consider right now, but this is, this is very interesting. And I think people overlook the question of migration with respect to uh, uh, both population growth and availability of jobs. Since 2016, we've, we've had year after year of continued declines in the international migration to the United States. And, and there are many good reasons for this. Backlogs to the immigration why. system. Who doesn't know somebody uh, or a firm or company who had their heart broken by uh, the immigration system where they were on the deck to have a, a permanent residency card and something fell through on the lottery side or, and, and it's all these things. And, and US policy uh, uh, that were instituted on the last administration in particular, there are about 400 different executive orders around the question of immigration and limiting Im immigration, has reduced uh, immigrant flow to the United States to basically the lowest level we've seen in many decades, arguably effectively since, since you know, wartime Great Depression era. So, so immigrants are particularly responsive to economic conditions. And this is an important aspect. So if we look at this from an economic research standpoint, um, uh, immigrants are very good at going where labor is needed. And right now, uh, a dearth of immigrants, and if we add, if we sort of assume, you know, if we even, you know, benchmark this to say 2011 levels of 800,000 net international migrants each year, you know, we end up, we're adding up, well, we're in, we're in a deficit of 600, 400 into the, into the low millions, uh, at least uh, potentially as high as 2 million in one economics paper that came out of workers that are no longer there. That would be a huge, and when we think about this, when we don't have workers to fill jobs that we need to function, that is a drag on our economic recovery. And, and that economic recovery then can't proceed. And the, the job market has a very tough time equalizing that. It produces uh, strange distortions. And it would be a very, I mean, I mean it's obviously immigration, uh, legalization is, is a complex phenomenon and many people have different opinions and experiences through it. But the level of difficulty as well as the level of, of, of um, sort of how it's, how it's created, processed, marketed could be, you know, one priority of uh, a, a jobs forward administration would be to look at this and reform it in a very positive way. Um, and, and there's so much uh, and that's one one sort of victim of sort of sort of even I would argue both administrations have been more nativist uh, in their trade policies, but also uh, in, in sort of our, our international appearance. So we are missing millions of workers that otherwise aren't there, and we're not making it up for it generationally or with population growth. 
So this issue itself is 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 a huge huge effect into into sort of looking at I would argue the the general economic situation, so to speak. But driving down more sunny sides, let's talk a little bit about the Bay Area. So let's get on the Bay Area further. You're here for the Bay Area. You were sold on the Bay Area. You live in the Bay Area, and you're like, what? I need a job in the Bay Area. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, so the good news is if we do a, a tour de force around unemployment rates uh, uh, from December 20 to December 2021, I'm including this side, the uh, BLS does a little, like they, there's a couple of economic policy reports that come out uh, in different places about this. This one's very interesting. The job market data you know, for January hasn't yet been updated in the BLS system. So I've already given you December. I'm not gonna, I don't want to repeat the same content twice. So apart from me quoting what the Federal Reserve does every, every month, uh, but uh, unemployment rates across the board uh, for California, 5% in general in, in December 2021, down from 9.1 in, in December 2020. But again, Bay Area compares favorably to the rest of California in unemployment rate. Um, one side, though, of course, is that when you think about average weekly wages, uh, the peninsula, you got more money, <laughs> more money, more peninsula problems. Uh, uh, and then you have, of course, uh, some other factors, which I thought were really interesting, um, which include a sort of a breakdown as we look at spending and distributions, how people spend money in the US versus how they spend it in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area. And we find out, for instance, of course, and, and this is scaled to 100%. So obviously, people are spending a lot more in the Bay Area than they are in the United States. And these numbers don't add up, but we can look proportionately at this. And the things when we think about, when we think about weights like CPI, which is what we're going to talk about next, you just have to weight housing in the Bay Area just more. It's more an aggregate. It's more period. Transportation proportionately is actually a little bit less uh, uh, than uh, consequently. And then personal insurance, healthcare, and all other items fall proportionately about to where we'd expect them to be in the rest of the United States. One interesting factor about this, and I'm going to blow this little chart up here so you can see it a little bit more. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be, <laughs> it's like an old bitmap from 1993. So here's what we got. So, so we have, uh, these are right now in December, wages for different occupations in San Francisco versus the United States. Put on your economist hat and try to figure out if you were looking at this, if you're looking at the premiums that the Bay Area charges over United States averages, could you figure out where there would be potential job shortages? And so I'll give you, so we'll, we'll line this up a little bit, right? So we know that in aggregate across all occupations, the average wage, wage in the Bay Area is about 39.35 an hour, which is enough to share with 85 other people and maybe live in an apartment. But uh, uh, to give you a sense of that, that's much lower. That's only a slight premium actually, let me, oops. Do that. That's actually just a 45% premium over the United States average. So the question is, 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 is that uniform across occupations? And one thing I want to note is that look at electricians for a second. In the United States, an average electrician uh, uh, makes about $29.59. In San Francisco, uh, they make about $51.29. And so before you go and, you know, you, you think, oh, my goodness, I, I picked the wrong career path and I should have been an electrician. That's what I said. Uh, that's a 73% premium. And so our anecdotal evidence without providing uh, additional research and knowing that uh, this could be flawed suggests that in particular in the metro area in San Francisco, there is a premium for, for elect electrician type work in a very meaningful way. Um, compare that again to chefs on the other hand, which again, you're only at like a 20% premium above the United States average. So relatively speaking, uh, chefs and head cooks uh, have the short end of the living stick in the Bay Area relative to the rest of the country. You could be a, a high earning chef in Louisville, or uh, you can be just a, we just have so many chefs and there's so many chefs in the Bay Area. I don't know, but the thing is, is that there's, it, it gives you a sense of where job shortages actually might exist. Um, and we have this thoroughly across many occupations, but not all. My guess is it doesn't, we don't have, um, I'll tell you, we don't have access to sort of the, the nuanced detail work in, involving this. But one thing, especially as you enter into a market or you look at moving or entering, say, a market and, and sort of gauging roughly uh, uh, how the market job market is entailing, you can look at uh, prevailing wages relative to national wages. And the idea being is that jobs in greater demand or jobs where there are fewer people uh, 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 that are capable and competent to do those jobs would potentially command higher premiums 
um, ceteris paribus. So it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting dialogue. And likewise, if there was a surplus of certain workers, you know, if you were flooded with certain workers in different aspects, you would likely have, uh, have lower wages and lower premiums. So it's very interesting. Now, if we also took that up to California and looked at California labor data, and just looking back over the last five years of Bureau of Labor Statistics data and comparing uh, labor underutilization, and we talk about this anecdotally a lot, and we talk about different aspects of this, but the idea that you're underutilized suggests that you'd want a better job, you'd want a full-time job when you're stuck with a part-time job. Underutilization is something that, that is so unfortunate for workers to experience. But in here, two alternative measures are U3 and U6. U3 is what reported U6 is uh, uh, our, our broadest measure of labor underutilization. The important takeaway is in general, California has higher unemployment rates. But when we think about labor utilization, proportionately, if we look at these levels, um, during 2020, during the height of the pandemic and coming down, I apologize for the resolution. Like I like when you, I haven't seen a paper, you know, when you connect uh, uh, five annual dots as opposed to um, monthly dots and, and we're just trying to get rid of noise, but it does look, it looks like my seven-year-old son made this. But uh, one thing is, is you have a, uh, 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 the California U6 rate, the util underutilization rate is substantially higher than the US rate. And uh, proportionately, it has remained higher uh, by a significant amount all through 2021 uh, to a level where we're sort of this is this is a, essentially a three and a half four percent difference between California and US U6 numbers, and that has remained consistent. It hasn't decreased in response to this, and and that's a very interesting observation that why the labor uh, uh, why the labor situation in California just has so many underutilized workers relative to where you think. This is a key, this is a very interesting, interesting fact. Now, and also feel free to ask any questions. We can take a break. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep talking and I'm gonna keep drinking my, my sparkling water and I'm gonna, you know, we're just gonna, we're gonna rock through this. So this is another thing, of course, one of my other favorite charts, this time done in a uh, uh, more, think you're back in the early 90s and it's aqua and it's, it's, it's light blues and different colors. Anyway, in purples. So uh, this is the share of owner occupied households who have not moved since 1999 across different cities in the country. Guess which city was the number one for people aged 65 years and over who remain in their house and have not moved for 23 years, can I get a drum roll? Wait a second, no, it is San Francisco. So 70% of owner-occupied households owned by seniors, they have not moved since 1999. Fascinating. LA, 68, almost 69%. And then you have Philadelphia, a little bit lower than that, New York, Chicago, Washington, expensive real estate markets uh, in general. And then at the very, at the other end of the spectrum, you have Las Vegas, we're only 30%. Again, uh, a haven for retirees, an unfair estimate, because many retirees are coming to places like Phoenix, Las Vegas, Tampa, and Orlando, and Austin. And so they've moved more recently. So it's very interesting when you think about the input and output of, of the Bay Area. There aren't a lot of retirees coming in for the first time to the Bay Area. What affordable housing, they say, <laughs> as they look at the $2 million, 600 square foot uh, uh, house. But uh, 35 to 64 years is comparable to the rest of the country. So big picture here is this shows you sort of the sense of, of housing mobility. Um, and to give you a sense of this, you know, we know that owner occupied right rates in, in San Francisco, if we're thinking of the city itself, uh, trail, uh, uh, the, uh, the ownership rate trails substantially behind the rest of the country. About two thirds of, of Americans of working age own, own a house. Um, that's a little bit, that's, that's right around 50% in, in San Francisco uh, due to the high prices. And so of those people who do own those homes, they tend, uh, uh, there's a sizable proportion that are indeed older and they, they, they have not moved for an incredible amount of time. And that reduces churn in many respects to real estate markets. So it has many good things and bad things about it, but in this particular case, it does reduce churn. And ultimately, when you think about finding deals or, or a market that might be responsive to fundamental changes in the housing market strategies, uh, uh, you look for churn as a way to show uh, uh, a sort of elasticity in housing market prices and supply. All right, so questions on the first section before we dive a little bit deeper into CPI and equities. Anybody have anything? There's no such thing as a dumb one. Well, I mean, it's a, it was a kind of a small question, but uh, yes. scrolling up for your um, 
uh, labor participation rate. I was wondering at the time, what is a good, uh, even further, I think is the third, oh. third slide. Oh, wow, that's good. That's an ancient slide. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering like, what, what is a good benchmark? Because <laughs> clearly if, if it goes to 75 or below right. it's a recession, is 80 a good number? Uh, in this case, 70. In this, oh, focus on the slope. Always focus on the slope. It's one of those things. So the slope is always going to be key. 80s are 80 is a really good number in aggregate for us in this economy with our current status. Uh, 75 is actually a bad number. Uh, so between those levels, when you're between 75 and 80, if you're under 75, it's terrible. Uh, but if you're above 75 and, and any level, look at the slope and see how it's going. Like, like we go through long periods of stasis with participation, uh, Colin, like uh, between uh, sort of the tech bubble recession and the Great Recession, uh, the employment to population ratio was basically stable in the upper 70s during that time period. And, and when we, what we have now is, is sort of this surge. And I often wonder if we think about this, if we have an inflationary economy and, and a decent enough, and, and the jobs are still going, whether people or whether inflation or the effects of inflation, we could view this, I mean, are people going to view this as something? And again, it's been 40 years since we've had uh, comparable data. And that was a very different US economy in, 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 that, in that age. So when we think about uh, uh, sort of the, the changes to our job force participation rate, is it likely that higher inflation will force more people onto the job market that may not otherwise be there? You know, even retirees, for instance, um, many pensions and many social security pensions, many pensions, private and otherwise, public, private, and in, in everything in between, uh, don't offer cost of living adjustments or COLAs that are equivalent to match an inflationary level. So my suspect if we sustained inflation for a long time and we erode, say, say retirees uh, 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 purchasing power, uh, relatively speaking, you know, you'll see more people approaching the job market at different ages. You'll see greater robustness. But in 25 to 54, what's surprising to me is that there's there we didn't see there was so much speculation about people uh, leaving the job for it, workforce or people in their late 20s and they don't want a job or whatever it is, or they go back for a master's program. And that's just not evidenced by the data relative to other time periods. And, and that's interesting. So people say a lot of things and it's just, and it's just, the, I mean, and I'm, I'm agnostic to the question until you show me the data, but the data doesn't show it. Ah, it's a great okay. question. Thank you. No, oh, Colin, anything else you got? That's cool. This oh, is really cool. I, I love your question. I see a chart like that. I'm just like, okay, what's the benchmark for what's good, what's bad? Right. That's a good question. We can't, we, how can we learn anything without benchmarks? So speaking of benchmarks, uh, I can tell you this, our benchmark on oil and wheat is, <laughs> we have exceeded that benchmark and now it is expensive. So let's talk a little bit about the markets right now. And, and this is leading into our CPI calculation. So commodities, commodities, things that we trade. Why does it that when we have a hurricane in Bangladesh, that, that there's, that there's, there, that affects prices globally. And this is always a question that becomes so befuddling. And that's because of the globally integrated network of our markets, supply chains, and, and people mean that, that everything that we have and produce is often considered globally as, as part of that aggregate production. And so oil is in, in oil and wheat, and oil looks like it's a acronym. I don't know why I capitalized all of those. Uh, oil and wheat are both incredibly expensive right now. Oil is currently trading at about $110 a barrel. So oil is interesting. There's actually two ways that we price oil globally. It's actually fallen to 109, but it's up a little bit in after hours. Um, $110 a barrel. So, so oil is, is, is one of two benchmarks we use globally to figure out the price. The one that we call WTI is the one we quote most often in the United States. And this is actually determined in a small town central in, in, in Oklahoma called Cushing. And it's called West Texas Intermediate. And it, and it basically gauges the ongoing price of oil in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the sort of oil that's produced in the South Central and Southwest United States. And, uh, and it's, it's important because it's a very accurate depiction of global commodities. So oil is traded often through futures contracts and other ways, which is basically futures are ways that we, uh, many firms employ futures contracts uh, uh, to help hedge their risk 
on, uh, on prices. So if you're selling oil and you want to lock in a fair rate, you'll institute a futures contract and agree to sell at some fixed price price down the line. And what we can do is we can observe those futures contracts and what people are, are exchanging for them. And we get a sense for, for what oil prices actually are. And so oil right now is at the highest level we've seen since, since 2011. And, and, and uh, when it earlier, like a day and a half ago, it hit a price that we haven't seen since 2008. Uh, wheat, on the other hand, is also very interesting, also near all-time highs. And there's a few reasons for this. And so, and so I mentioned, if you were here earlier in the, when I, at the beginning of this, when we were small, chat, small talk chatting, the US consumes about 18 million barrels of oil a day. The United States is actually the largest oil producer in uh, the world right now. We have about 20%. We make about 20, we make, <laughs> we make like it's a factory. We're making oil. Uh, we, 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 we extract process and otherwise put up for sale about 20% of the world's supply of oil. Uh, the three top oil producing states are Texas, North Dakota, and New Mexico. And what we've seen is we've seen a surge in, in sort of production in the last 10 years that have been driven primarily by technological improvements uh, on, on the extraction processes, um, stuff like fracking and other things that are related to it uh, and related processes have become uh, uh, have become much more economically tenable in the last few years. Uh, the dollar per barrel uh, in 2015, I believe, uh, the break-even point, you, to, if you were fracking in, in the Permian Basin in West Texas, you uh, could only frack if oil was $70 a barrel uh, as a break-even, and, and then it dropped to like $40 a barrel now. And, and, uh, and when oil trades at 110, it incentivizes producers to produce more oil. Uh, when you take off, uh, when Russia, which is the third largest producer of oil, is taken out of the market, it does affect us in very meaningful ways. Russia also, also produces a sizable but meaningful percentage of the world's wheat production. Wheat is also produced heavily in the Ukraine. And consequently, uncertainty in these regions and war in these regions have sent the price of wheat up to, to near all-time highs. Before you go back and you, know, you, you look to potentially investing in that farm and leaving that day job in uh, uh, in uh, Silicon Valley for that dream job of finally being a wheat farmer in central Kansas. Uh, the issue is, is, is that commodity prices are notoriously volatile, notoriously volatile. You can go through periods of time where your net return on these are negative. We were just talking about this in my last meeting. Uh, you know, there was a period of time where net over like 15 years where you ended up with a negative 15% return across many commodities. But this uncertainty, this uncertainty is important to acknowledge because not only is oil something that we use for, that we visualize as something that goes into making gasoline, which we drive around in, but it's also functional to everything that requires oil to distribute between any network. So when you think about oil prices going up, you're also raising distribution costs and distribution costs then uh, affect things like food prices. Uh, and all of these things are tied together. So oil becomes in turn, not only an inflation generator in its own right, but also a driver of all these other like side inflationary measures. And, uh, and that becomes important. And also getting the wheat that you've grown in your you know, hobby farm in, in, in Emporia, Kansas, uh, back to market, uh, you know, back to Silicon Valley. And you're like, maybe there's an arbitrage opportunity. You go and you, 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 have, you farm a few acres of land and then you drive a truck back you know, uh, uh, you know, and then you sell it at the farmer's market in Santa Rosa and one of those things and you just you just make money. But uh, but the problem is, is these are really volatile and they affect everything. So when we think about this and, and we think about the question of inflation as it looks towards our long term, our long term angles, uh, uh, we know that inflation in our last reading and we know we're going to get another reading in the next couple of days. And I had hopes that we would see a little bit of a decline. I still hope that we'll see a little bit of a decline below seven and a half percent. I'm not confident about that number and I'm not confident about the decline being meaningful. I hope to be pleasantly surprised, but CPI right now, and I'm going to use the weightings for uh, the consumer price index for urban consumers. The component weightings look a bit like this. This is a proportional basket of goods that somebody would buy and how the prices change over time. And they're supposed to be broadly generalistic, but we can apply them locally. There's local, the Bay Area has their own CPI as well. That's got a little bit more weighting for housing. Uh, but across the country, it's basically 14% food and beverage, 42% housing, 18% transportation, 8% medical care, 6% education, 5% recreation, 7% other. So the thing about CPI is you won't use all of these goods in a given time period, right? You're not going to use, hopefully you won't use 8% of every month's budget that you have on medical care. It is just going to be 0% of your budget. And then one month it'll be 
280% of your budget. So you have this thing. So it's a weird, it's a weird representation. And we understand the issues with this model. But if we look at what makes up CPI on the left versus the actual price changes that we've observed in the last 12 months, we come away with some very interesting conclusions. The first of which is which energy itself and energy to give you a sense of this, gas falls into transportation, which is based off of oil prices. But in housing costs, it also includes, say, oil and natural gas-based heating is also a line item within there. So oil can appear in either directly in multiple categories or within, say, uh, food and beverage prices going up through a distribution network and just getting putting gas in trucks to distribute them becomes more expensive. So what we have here, we go down all these items and notice that this goes, the left-hand side is obviously zero. That first uh, uh, dotted line here, which might be really tough to read, is 10%. So these ratios, even at the 10% level, are extraordinarily high. Energy costs are going to drive inflation over the next few months, period. They're going to drive them because we were hoping that energy costs might come down a little bit. And then we're looking at year-on-year -year changes kind of evening out. We went from an incredibly low period of energy costs in 2020 to, an, to a much higher cost in 2021. And the idea was, as we looked at the year-on-year -year, in those first two months drop off, uh, in, in 2021, as we approach January, February, that uh, uh, oil, if it was steady, would produce uh, uh, proportionately a lower amount of additional uh, CPI growth. But because it surged in the last couple of weeks, and particularly as we look towards next month, I expect that energy, any energy relief we see this month will be wiped out uh, next month. Um, commodities, energy, energy right across the board. Used cars and trucks, of course, famously uh, up 40%. And, and yes, we are moving towards other technologies, but the problem is, of course, is that building out the infrastructure for the electric, uh, electric cars or alternative energy vehicles, it takes so long and our consumption is so gas oriented still that it's just, uh, uh, there isn't enough that they can do. Um, and on the other side of this, uh, food also, and this is perhaps most telling, uh, was up in aggregate about 7% in the last year, which is a lot. And this particularly hits low-income families where food is proportionately higher as a percentage of uh, monthly income uh, than, um, than, than, as a, than you see at sort of higher income levels. And, um, but it's been an aggregate and, and food at home has been high. And again, what drives food prices has been meats, poultry, fish and eggs, things that require uh, uh, complex distribution networks and other things as well. Um, and then, so all of this stuff goes into it and, and all of this stuff is weighted into this. And we've seen shifting happen in the CPI and we're gonna continue to see shifting happen in, this, in the CPI. So across the West in general, we've seen CPI go up about 7.7%, slightly higher than the 7.5% nationally. Again, driven by that proportion in particular, what drives Western CPI? Additional housing costs. Uh, housing costs in particular have gone up. Uniquely, the Bay Area, uh, much less so because they've already been, they're already so expensive. So, so this is not even at the resolution that you would expect, but uh, CPI levels are still high. And to give you a sense of how high 7.7% is, like going back to 20, 2002, we've seen no number near that level. And the closest was back in uh, the beginning of the recession, of the Great Recession in, in late 2008, early 2009, we hit uh, about 5% or so. Uh, CPI. And that was the last time we saw numbers at this level. So things about this to think about as well as you approach this, other bad news in the Bay Area. So let's look at the average price of gasoline at the upper left, electricity at the upper right, and then natural gas or pipe gas uh, down in the uh, bottom center. And you can see if we compare the US to San Francisco, San Francisco, the best part about this graph is even as prices rise across the United States, San Francisco, not one to be beat out in a proportional representation of increased prices, shows that uh, if the US goes up 20%, you know, let's go up 30%. So the interesting part about this, particularly for electricity prices at the upper right, is that not only have US prices been okay, circling, it went up from about 13 to about 15 cents per kilowatt hour. I mean, I mean, in the same time period in the last year, uh, prices per kilowatt hour in the Bay Area, Bay Area have gone up from about 24 to 28 cents 
uh, per kilowatt hour. Keep and you're you're watching this on Zoom, so turn down your monitor uh, uh, projections. I'm gonna make it really bright on my. <laughs> I just can't do it. Just turn on, you know, your graphics card. You know, you you have your 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 Bitcoin mining rig. You know, take a couple graphic cards out of there and just you know put them to rest. But it's it's terrible to see this, and it's just it just adds to that additional sense of cost. So when we think of other things that 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 influence prices and and the nature of business decisions. Uh, uh, electricity is a huge part of this. And, uh, and so one thing is, and in, in, uh, uh, Albert in the questions brought up questions around elasticity of certain prices. And it's actually remarkably, it's remarkable to show that I had hoped in my head that and when I thought of looking at this question, that uh, we would see as US prices increased, as I know they've been, sort of the San Francisco prices because they're built in with different regulatory frameworks would actually would actually increase by a, a, a less uh, profound margin. But they actually increased by an equal, if not more percentage uh, than the United States, particularly around uh, uh, electricity and gas. Uh, so what does this mean for the markets? I'm gonna end this with a couple slides about the markets. So right now um, we, were, we were posited or, or Colin, and Albert, uh, Colin and Albert were talking to me about different uh, uh, potential ideas to talk about. And since a lot of you out there uh, are equity owners, either indirectly or, or directly, you might own shares of a company you work for, you might have a 401k, you might have your own trading account. And, and so as a finance professor, looking at the stock market is near and dear to my heart, not only as the director of our student run portfolio of like, we have like 5 million bucks here, but also in my previous life um, in banking. Uh, but in uh, the Schiller, uh, one of the ways we look at, so, so, so I, I talk about this from time to time. Um, so I'm going to go over market sentiment. And then before I go over market sentiment, I want to talk a little bit about sort of so one measure called the price to earnings ratio. And the price to earnings ratio takes the price and divides it by the earnings per share, how much money the company actually makes. The idea being is that uh, uh, earnings per share is the um, net income of the company divided by the number of shares outstanding. And so when you have a ratio and you want to take a ratio, for instance, of, for instance, something like uh, uh, the price of, of a stock is $50 a share and they make $5 per share every year, 50 divided by five, that gives you a price to earnings ratio of 10. Over the long term, the United States' average has been around 20 for price to earnings. Um, it's been, I would actually argue that in the post-1980 economy, uh, uh, around 30 is more typical. But again, to that point, uh, uh, the number that we have right now, even after, and this is updated today, after the contraction that we've seen at the beginning of this year, still shows that on average, stock prices are about 35 times more than actual earnings. Now, this is historically quite high. And what does that mean? So when the price to earnings ratio is very high, we often say the market could be overvalued, but not always. And if the price to earnings ratio is low, we could say a stock or the market as a whole could be undervalued. So for instance, back in the late 70s and early 80s, the price to earnings ratio was really low. It was below 10 because because what happened was inflation was so high, the Federal Reserve rate was so high, the discount rate was so high that uh, people didn't have an incentive to put money in the market. They could earn 14, 15, 16% buying government bonds, sometimes more than that. And so why would I take on additional risk uh, 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 by putting my money in the market, which is an uncertain outcome, versus putting my money in things like bonds, which offer uh, as a fixed income instrument, a certain level of security as long as the firm itself doesn't default. So, so you have then, in beginning in the 80s, we saw, we saw rapid increases. The year 2000, of course, that big spike is the tech bubble. Uh, we had a bunch of companies that had very high prices but didn't make any money, and a lot of those companies went bankrupt. Now the market is actually very different than those things. We have a lot of companies making money. And indeed, if we look back in the last few quarters, roughly 80% of S&P 500 companies have actually beat earnings estimates. And uh, around 64% in the last quarter actually beat their revenue estimates that are provided by analysts who, who follow these companies. And so it's a very interesting thing to see, especially in the marketplace, that it's still so high. In short, the thing I want to, to look out for is especially if the Fed raises rates and bonds become more attractive, people will start shifting money from stocks into bonds. And so keep an eye on this market in particular, because if people shift money, they're going to shift it out of from equities, which are more volatile, they have more risk, they, your highs are higher and your lows are lower. And people often, even though your long term returns are very good, you have a lot of people who could potentially be taking profits, other things. So be careful around the markets based on this principle alone, and keep an eye on those rates and keep an eye on, on where people's incentives 
numbers lie. On the other side of this, we have, of course, market sentiment. So CNN has this fear and greed index. This is one thing of many. And then I, I, uh, uh, and then I looked at uh, the AI, AAII, um, our association of, 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 uh, of investors. And when we think about uh, the American Association, I'm sorry, of individual investors, and they have two different sentiment indexes. So indices, I should say. The first at CNN on the upper left, that has this little, they have this little, they have this little, like, it's like a widget. And it tells you, are people greedy or are they fearful? And this goes back to an old adage by Warren Buffett, which, which, uh, which I'll paraphrase by saying, when other people are being, uh, when other people are being greedy, be fearful. And when people are being fearful, be greedy. And so this is kind of a perception of what you should do in the market. So it's counterintuitive. The idea being is you should resist the sort of human tendency for herd mentality, follow other people into, so if people are afraid of buying into the stock market, maybe it's a time to look for opportunities and, and other investments, but it's it, it depends. So right now we have a high level of fear, <laughs> extreme fear, I would say. This is good. I just, 2022 needed this. After the last two years, I'm like, what could possibly come around the bend? We need a rating to show how fearful we are. Uh, and extreme fear, not only geopolitically, but also within, and this is only within the context of markets. Um, and, and this has vacillated with time, but we're actually the most fearful and concerned about the market right now. Uh, that we've been since really in the middle of the pandemic. This doesn't mean ipso facto that you're going to end up with potentially finding the market's going to go up 50% in the next year. That's not what this means. This does mean that investors are fearful. That means the market is more volatile and more unpredictable. But it also could mean that mispricing uh, uh, is can potentially occur in different stocks. Stocks could become under oversold very quickly and represent buying opportunities. There's a lot of options on the table. And then if we ask uh, uh, the American Association of Individual Investors, this question. They pull this every week and they ask their members and they say, how do you feel? Are you bullish on the market? Do you think the market will go up? Are you bearish on the market? Do you think it'll go down? And what we've seen is that uh, bears in February, especially right before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, reached record territory, about 54% that we've seen, not record, record in this year in 2022. And then they've since come back what we've seen, if I look at a longer data set in this, is we still have a very about one third of people uh, are bullish on the market right now. They think there are opportunities to grow and the market will continue to go up. 40% uh, are bearish. They think the market will go down. 28%, and in which case, these are the true economists and financial professionals who are too afraid of actually expressing an opinion. And they have so much information in their heads that they can't, <laughs> they, they're, they're paralyzed. Uh, and, and that's my camp. I'm always neutral. But uh, on either side of these two equations, uh, or on these two on these two opinions, you have in the last year we were most bullish. It's sort of during uh, uh, the in April of 2021, uh, where 57 percent of people were bullish. We were most bearish just uh, two weeks ago, and it changes week to week. And we've seen actually the neutral. If we look back two months on this, and I included more data, the percentage of people who are neutral has actually decreased substantially. We're now split in the market into two camps. And when those camps interact, you have more volatility. And then that's why VIX, our way that we look at, which is a ratio of, 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 of options, VIX is often a good way, our little, our, our volatility met, met, metrics to see how volatile the markets are right now. Differing opinions on calls and puts, calls the right to buy a stock, puts are the right to sell a stock. And so VIX has a, a, a pulse on the options market and, and measures a, a way of telling how uh, volatile the market conditions are. And we've seen this sort of volatility kind of come up in a very meaningful and gradual way in the last couple of months. So the short answer to that is just be careful out there. And then lastly, um, and this is really interesting, and, and there's a couple of, I think it's Callan uh, uh, that has a fund that actually looks at, they actually made a fund uh, in finance that, uh, um, that sort stocks, I'm not selling this or advocating for it. They've actually had really good returns in the last year and a half. I just read about this uh, the other day. They've had really good returns by identifying stocks that do well in contractionary environments uh, by the Fed, stocks that do well in expansionary environments in the Fed, and then switching between those two numbers when, when depending on federal monetary, Fed, the Fed policy. So as the Fed enters a contractionary phase this year, uh, there are certain behaviors that are predictable. But the reason I'm showing you this chart, I'm looking at XLK, which is our, our technology sector ETF. So it's just a, a 
basket of technology stocks. And then of course, compared, comparing that to the S&P 500, which is in that light blue. So I apologize for people with blue level color. I realize I'm comparing a light blue color to a dark blue color. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> I apologize. The dark blue though is on the bottom for most of this chart and the light blue is on the top if it's difficult to read. So uh, the XLK, so tech stocks, one question that often comes up is, you know, you know, we take it for advantage. If the Fed raises rates, surely won't this affect tech stocks worse than other sectors, right? That's the thesis behind it. And the idea is, is that tech stocks are most responsive to economic conditions. They're responsive heavily to their ability to get financing and they're responsive heavily to a lot of market conditions. But if I compare this and I didn't mark on this chart because I obviously grabbed it from Yahoo Finance, hence the watermark uh, at the last minute. But uh, we had a very uh, controlled Contractionary policy between 2004 and 2006. We raised rates very steeply, about 4% uh, during that time period. And as you can see, uh, XLK technology stocks did underperform uh, uh, the S&P 500 slightly during this time period, but it wasn't a devastating process for these stocks. The stocks, the rates didn't go up and the stocks didn't drop 30%. That's not what happened. And then if we go back again to where we had the same effect in, in, 20, uh, uh, in 2017, 2018, we actually noticed that they, they, they track pretty well together. In general, the aspect of the Fed raising rates or the big picture is, is often um, depressing for the stock market in general, not specific to technology stocks individually. But there is some evidence to suggest that some, in a, if the contractionary environment was particularly steep, 2018 wasn't a, a steep contraction environment. 2004, 2005 absolutely was. There is a risk of underperformance there. But every situation is different and depends on, on, on everything that's happening across, across the board. Ah, all right. That was an hour and 20 minutes of 18 slides. That's terrible. That's a terrible time to slide ratio. How are you guys doing? Are you guys alive? I'm amazed there's still 17 participants. You guys are... I'm going to name, if I ever have 18 children, I will name the other 17 after each of our participants today. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. No, we're, <laughs> we're one and done. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to digest here. I think one of the yeah. um, relevant to our audience, uh, one of the questions that just came into my head was if tech stocks are yes. more adversely affected by raising rates, yeah. Does this mean that for job seekers negotiating compensation packages, ah. uh, stocks, <laughs> restricted stock units yeah. might, should be viewed, or we should price that in as this might be worth a lot less than we expected? Oh, that's our, oh, I love that question, Colin. I love it. So, okay, okay. So you're negotiating stock. All right, this is, this is a really good question. Okay, so... So let's think about this in general. So I still think so. So one easy way to accumulate wealth in a company that you believe in is to, in addition to your salary, which is you should always demand a good market rate salary in addition to equity options, uh, options, uh, either stock awards themselves or the option to purchase stock are itself or could be potentially very valuable. And but to do that, to your point, Colin, there is a certain calculation you have to make as to what those options might be worth. And it is true, and I like your placement of this. So right now we're entering a contractionary environment. It's difficult to say, and I guess you could likewise argue that maybe the Fed will be so worried about over-contracting that maybe the contractionary environment lasts for only a few months and then they have to drop rates again because we end up in, 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 in more dire economic conditions. But if that's the case, in actually, in either one of those cases, that is fair. When you value your options, and, and, and I'm not just thinking about this and, and just thinking about not only the stock award themselves, often your stock awards may come with a, a form of compensation that um, uh, where you can acquire additional stock at a discount, all of those things. And you know, I, I learned this the hard way because similarly, when I negotiated one of my first pay elements, I was super psyched. To, to receive equity awards as a component of, of my compensation package. And I had wholly misjudged the market for my company with regards, with regards to those ratios because I was 21 and I was like, you know, I, I was like 
smart, but streetwise, I had the common sense of like a box of rocks. So I had like these, I had these issues that were, you know, I was unprepared. I was like, you know, in my head, I'm like, okay, if I acquire this discount and I acquire these options in this stock and, and they had an, my, my stock, the company I worked for had an agreement to be bought by an international firm uh, for a price that was like an 80% premium over the current price. And so not only did I have the equity awards, but also I had this, this little, 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 um, a uh, uh, little um, buffer of a, of a discount uh, of, of awards, I could get stock at a cheaper price. And the problem was, is this two, three, four years ahead of, this was, this was, this was ahead of time that they had this deal. It was a very long-term deal. And I thought it was easy money. Uh, and unfortunately this would have happened. The deal would have actually happened if 2008 physically didn't happen because 2008 was the end year of the, uh, of, of the stock awards. So I ended up, um, the, end, the, st the company did end up being sold uh, to uh, the same company that was international, but not for $40 a share, for $2 a share. So it ended up being a uh, devastating, <laughs> and it wasn't my, it was not primarily my fault, but uh, one of the things <laughs> of was, <laughs> it was not, I promise. Oh man, I wish I had that power. Uh, no, it was <laughs> just me and my, my incorrectly specified profitability models, quantitative elements I was designing for them. So I was looking at this and, and I, in retrospect, it is so important to be cautious and careful about any equity acquisition value this based on certain things. One thing to look at this is, 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 is in levels of uncertainty, increase the discount rate in your future calculations, not only of your earnings and how much you could potentially look at, discount rates can absorb uncertainty and help. Uh, if you're trying to figure out what $40, a $40 stock price is worth in five years, discount that back today. And with greater uncertainty, apply a greater discount rate, be more conservative about those estimations and know that when you enter into this. And, um, and the hard part is of course, is recessions are often short things. And then you wanna also preserve, you don't wanna shoot yourself in the foot now. And let's say the market does correct for 20% or 30% more from what it is now. And I'm not saying it will, I'm not, I'm not offering that advice. And those long-term, longer term options would be really valuable. If your company doesn't go under and it shouldn't, and none of this is, let me back up. So I'm in a hypothetical situation where the market drops 30%, and we enter a recession, if your company survives, positioning yourself to acquire additional equity when the, when the company is really cheap can result in, in, in substantial gains in the long run. And so not only, so the issue of course for you is timing, 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 timing. Where do you think uh, uh, the stock price will be in five, 10 years? If you can occupy or you can justify being a part of the company for a long run, I mean, it, it might not actually make a difference, but, but in the short run, you know, it is something to consider and is something to value. I love that. I love that question. You know, I was thinking about that back when um, our primary options valuation model or the original options valuation model, the one that's still utilized, although it has some problems, is called the Black-Scholes model in, in, in finance. And it was written by, by, two, finance, by two finance faculty members and, and none of the other journals liked it. And, and it was finally published in this like B no-name journal and it became the most fundamental um, influential pricing paper that we had in the last 50 years. So, so on a side note is that even when, uh, uh, but uh, if you look at that, the inputs to that model, it has a lot of things that, that, that we don't necessarily know all the time. Like we know, you know, we can calculate the implied volatility, but this stuff changes day to day. So as you approach your negotiations, be careful about this, be careful about equity. Don't um, work. If you're worried about stock prices, consider more traditional based compensation. That's what I would say in the, in the, in the short run. Because the last thing you want is to count on next year and negotiate a contract where 98% of your compensation is equity and they pay you like 30 bucks and the equity is worth nothing because the market is crashed. And so you're like, you're, you're keeping warm and you know, you're, you're collecting cups and, and on the street and burning them in like a makeshift stove and in an apartment you, you share with, with 13 other engineers. And, uh, and you had thought or hoped that you were going to be a billionaire. And, I, and you still can be. But yes, keep it in mind, but also keep your focus on the long run because that equity might pay off in the long run. That's what I would say. So maybe it's less important than it seems. <laughs> I just, you just brought up a lot of memories, Colin. So I, went, <laughs> I went down, I was like, I went through 18 shades of my past just then. And I was, I had the, I got the, <laughs> give me the willies. <laughs> I, guess my, 
I don't see anyone else dropping a question. So I have one more follow-up question, I guess. Sure. Um, which is following up the previous question, which is, um, isn't there also an amplification effect of mm. the equity value dropping because ultimately you have to sell it for huh. USD, which is currently in an inflationary period, which is yes. like a double whammy of really bad news. You're right. That's a really good, that's a good point. So yes, so you could argue, okay, you can argue that equities in general. So over the long run, if we look at a very long period of time from say 1930 to, to 2020, equities on average return about 11% a year. Mm -hmm. um, some years they return negative 40%. <laughs> some years they might return positive 43% or positive 28% or like the last two years have been really stellar for equities. And, and you're looking to position yourself in a way where, 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 and this is the hard part, is that forecasting individual prices for stock is, is almost impossible, is almost an impossible task. And, 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 and one of the, and I, here's a, one of, actually, we had a, you know, we've, we've tried this in academic finance. This is a thing that, you know, it's that, that holy grail mechanism. Can you produce a model that predicts the market? And the closest model that we've actually created to, to predict the market, so to speak, it's a random walk model that we've positively biased or skewed towards, towards higher returns. Uh, as, so basically something that's been around since, since the chemist, what Robert Brown examined the motion of small particles in a test tube 200 years ago and said, these are moving in strange ways. I wonder if I can model that. That same basic simplistic process that they've done is, is something that, that is the closest. And of course it's wrong. It won't predict day-to-day -day stock prices and it's terrible. But the fact is, is that we're, we're hopeless in the face of making actual predictions on individual stocks. The market in general, we can say it goes up in the long run and we, run, we can run a Monte Carlo simulation on, on market performance and, uh, and get the bounds, which are uh, bounds of likelihood where we expect the market to be. And so if you explore any of these options, think long-term and you can use free tools that are available online. Um, portfoliovisualizer.com is one of them. They have a way for you to actually make the same predictions a financial advisor would. It asks for you to sign up and, and they want you to pay for it, but then you just don't sign up and they give it to you for free. Uh, and it has one of those things and you can just make an analysis. I, I send my students there all the time and it allows you to run Monte Carlo simulations or back test growth. Keep an eye on individual stocks. If your company is publicly traded, it'll be in that database. You can see and examine its historical movement over time. And then you, know, you can arrive at, uh, at some very interesting data. Uh, that will empower you to make good financial decisions. And I'm actually, I'll put it right here in the chat window. Whoops, maybe everyone, sorry. <laughs> just, I'll send it just to Colin and no one else can see. <laughs> that's good, okay. For the link, that's very interesting. So anyway, that's a cool tool to use uh, when you're thinking about looking at risk and for an individual company. And within that context, you asked about the amplification effect. So yes, inflation does put a higher hurdle on you to exceed that, that amount for real returns. But the interesting part is that often when we have inflation, we don't have corresponding real returns that are often very high. And so you have to view it almost in the sense of, of high inflation periods. And the other weird part about this is this is the first real inflation period we've had that hasn't also corresponded yet with, an, with a recession in the last 50 years. So we're looking at this in- <laughs> Don't jinx it yet. <laughs> I know, don't jinx it. Don't jinx don't it. Jinx it. <laughs> this is not jinx it. Mm. Okay. Wow, that's it. Cool. Anyone I, else? Any other thing? I believe that's all I have. Does anyone else have questions? We're opening um, the floor. Well, the floor has been open, but if nobody has questions, um, thank you everybody for attending tonight's uh, webinar. We hope that with this knowledge, you can make better financial decisions and uh, hopefully you know, have better ideas of how you want to negotiate your compensation package, um, know how to prepare uh, for the future and uh, whether or not there's an actual inflation uh, recession coming down the line, we will see. Um, next month, we will definitely be hosting this after the CPI co <laughs> report fine. comes out. Um, That's fine. That's fine. Discuss that. <laughs> uh, yes. uh, the recording will be posted on Albert's List um, YouTube page. Um, oh yes yeah yeah yeah. So, yes you can come back and take a look at it um but once again thank you everybody for joining us uh, i hope you have a wonderful evening and 
in light of recent events, please stay safe and have a strong, uh, take care of your mental health. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. <laughs> Thanks, Colin. Thank you.